Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual meeting of the West of England Combined Authority Audit Committee, which is also being broadcast on the Authority's YouTube channel. Uh, item two on our agenda is apologies for absence. Tim. Yes, Chair, we've, uh, we've received apologies from Councillor John Ash. Thank you. Um, do I have any declarations of interest from members? No? Okay, item four is the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of October, uh, which is on pages five to eight of our pack. Uh, is everybody happy that I approve those as a true record of that meeting? Is there anybody against? No, in which case that is carried and uh, I'll virtually approve those, Tim. Uh, item five on the agenda is items from the public. And Tim, if you could admit David Regwell to the meeting. Yes, no problem. He's just joining us now, Chair. Are you there now, David? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, yeah. And, and we can hear you. Welcome, David. You have three minutes for your statement. Thank you. Um, I think my concerns and my colleagues' concerns really are the um, revolving infrastructure fund. Um, there are various targets set by government uh, for the 31st of March, the next financial year, this financial year that we have to have projects started on the ground. And um, we have no project construction on the ground at Portway Park and Ride in Bristol, which is a major station project, partly funded by the Department of Transport. We have no construction on the ground of another LEP supported project in the terms of the Western um, uh, Sustainable Transport Package, which involves also the um, new bus station stroke interchange in Western Supermare. There's a list of, of risk projects and as audit, I just ask that you look at these particular projects and make sure that there is some delivery um, on the ground. Because the concern that we have is if you're seen to return money to central government, then it's very, very difficult for an authority then to obtain that money again the following year. And things like the new station fund, which Portway Park and Ride is part of, was a bid three years ago. Um, now, no, it goes back to the structure of WECA and the fact that we've obviously got one council that's not part of it properly and that should be resolved. There's a big financial risk in that in terms of political financial risk. But the other point about it is that um, if you return money to government, uh, you're very unlikely to get that sort of money back again. And I think the, the fact that WECA doesn't have railway delivery officers or a railway executive in the way that Greater Manchester does, or the way in which the Cambridge and Peterborough, which is a brand new, early, uh, brand new um, combined authority, um, is very alarming that the public transport unit that Peter Mann runs is very, very good. And I spoke to him yesterday about the, the, um, uh, the coronavirus bus operating grant and trying to get uh, grip to grips with some of the services that are still not running and they promised they would go and have a look at us 37 and the 18 so I'm very pleased with that conversation but there is need for resources and you know transport infrastructure still sits at Bristol City Council Baines and South Gloucestershire um, and by it's just a huge waste of public money not to bring these resources together put them into one organization and make sure they deliver for the people of Bristol and Bath City region and also incorporating the offices in North Somerset. So I really ask you to look at those issues and are we really getting value for money from having dispersed officers, the contract- And you come to a conclusion, David. Yeah, the final point to make to you, the contract between North Somerset and WECA to reopen the Portis headline and utilities is a 300 page document just to deal with uh, running a, a train service through North Somerset. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, I'm just wondering, Malcolm, if you're there, do you, I, I know you've 
already we've already got an answer to David's question about the um, the, the, the the riff fund, but I just wonder whether you wanted to comment and 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 give us the 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 correct interpretation of the position as this is in the public domain, as it were now. Uh, of course, Chair, yeah, I will, and, and a good question by by Mr. Ridgewell, but but. Um, the RIF fund he refers to is actually the schemes quoted in the question, our, our local growth fund figure. And, and Mr. Ridwell is actually right that, that we've got uh, a hard deadline of, of uh, 31st of March 2021 to spend the entire local growth fund. We've been knowing about this for some time. It's a £202 million uh, program across the whole region, including North Somerset. And we've been managing this very much as a single pot um, for, for the last couple of years since I've been with Weka. So we're very much mindful of uh, the hard deadline to spend. And, and I can reassure members, it's very much my nature not to return a penny to government. Um, so where we have had risks regarding schemes not delivering in time, we've actually swapped projects out of this program into EDF, Economic Development Fund, or sometimes even the Investment Fund. So we want to make sure we spend every last penny of a 202 million local growth fund. And recently in the last 18 months, we've been over programming against LGF by some 12 million pounds to ensure that we do have enough projects to spend the entire money by the time frame. Um, and so we've managed to push some projects back into 21-22, but I can reassure members we are working on every single one of those projects and we will assure that we do not return a penny to central government by the end of the deadline. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, and David, as ever, thank you for your, your statement and, uh, and, and keeping these issues at, uh, at the forefront of our consideration. So, thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, item six on the agenda is Chair's business. Um, all I can say is you know, please enjoy the virtual mince pie that I would have provided you with had we been meeting in person. Um, item seven is the Grant Thornton Annual Audit Letter 2019-2020. Are we going straight to Barry? Thank you very much, Chair. Yep, <clears throat> welcome, Barry. Thank you. So, um, Chair, just to briefly take you through this report. Um, so the Annual Audit Letter is a public document um, that, the, that the authority needs to publish. And it just summarises the key work that we've undertaken in the year. Now, much of the content of the annual report you'll have already, um, annual audit letter you'll have already seen within the um, audit findings report. Um, we are presenting to you an updated audit findings report that just reflects some of the changes that were made after the audit committee meeting on the 16th of October. And I will ask Sophie to briefly take you through those changes and those updates. Um, in a moment. Um, the one thing that I just wanted to bring to members' attention was um, Appendix A. Sorry, I should have said we did issue the audit opinion on the 18th of November uh, 2020. Um, I did just want to bring uh, members' attentions to Appendix A in the report, which covers uh, page 27 and 28. This just sets out the, uh, the report's issues and the timetable there, but also an update on the audit fees that were paid. At the time of the audit findings report, we indicated that um, our assessment of any additional fees as a result of COVID was still ongoing. We have now concluded that, and you'll see that an additional charge of just over four and a half thousand pounds was made to uh, the authority. Um, we've been in discussions with PSAA around the level of additional fees and the additional uh, the, the additional time that's taken as a result of COVID work. Um, and it's been agreed by PSAA that we, we use this approach. Um, the, uh, the level that we've charged is 15%, which is the minimum that we've agreed with PSAA that we would charge. Um, members may be aware that there are uh, much higher charges being made in other authorities. Um, members, can I just, before I hand over to Sophie, I just want to give a little bit of context to the, to the meeting as well. So you will remember uh, that we paid credit to the to the efforts of the finance team um, in responding to our audit inquiries. I believe that PSAA have now published the final outcome of the number of reports and audit opinions that were issued by the end of November, um, and that's about 45% nationally across all suppliers. So again, I would just like to put on record um, my thanks to your finance team for making sure that we were able to conclude the audit and report uh, positively by the deadline. 
Chair, I'm happy to take any questions, um, or if you'd prefer, we can let Sophie go through the updated audit findings report. Um, and then if I may, I'd just like to come back at the end just to mention a couple of changes to the, to the audit team going forward. Uh, I think it makes sense to go straight to Sophie, but just before that, can I just say thank you for, for emphasizing the, uh, the record of the finance team, which, which has been fantastic. And I think as a, a committee, we should formally minute that. And Solange and Steve, I know you're here, but we should still minute it so that it's on the record that we appreciate what you've done. Um, but Barry, can we also thank uh, thank you and your team for uh, for actually helping to deliver it as well? Because I think that was a, a, a real combined effort by, by both sides of the equation. So thank you for that. But if we go to Sophie now, and, and then we'll, we'll have questions from members after that. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so I'd just like to take you through the revised um, audit findings report. So as Barry said, uh, we did sign off the audit on the 18th of November. Um, the last audit findings report was taken to committee on the 16th of October. So there was around about a month between the two reports. Well, as a result of that, there are some additional findings um, just to draw to your attention that we reported to um, those to report to those charged with governance. So not uh, very many changes. And I have highlighted those in yellow so that it is uh, very clear um, as to what changes have occurred in the report. Um, so on page 33, it's just an update of the outstanding matters to conclude that at that point in time, the only thing left was the review of the final set of financial statements. And that was carried out um, on the 18th of November. Uh, just on page 37, just an update from the, uh, the pension fund auditor. At that point, we had received the letter. So just updating that there was material uncertainty in respect to the valuation of property funds owned by Avon Pension Fund. Um, we did trail that in the 16th of October letter, but it's just to formally conclude that that was included. Uh, page 38, this is around the new payroll system. Our work on that was in progress and we just conclude there that we were satisfied that the data transfer had been completed appropriately. Um, and then just looking a few pages down um, to page uh, 42, that was just confirming that the, uh, that the authority had sent us a letter of representation on the 17th of November. And then no major changes then until page, if I just click through, I believe it was quite a bit further down, uh, page uh, 54. So there was one adjustment that we just needed to report to you. Uh, this was just an adjustment to the 5G spend reducing income in year. However, this was correct in the draft accounts, but wasn't reflected in the working papers that were provided to us. So we do report that to you. Um, and on page 55, there are a number of misclassification and disclosure changes. So these are items that change the, the, the face of the accounts, but are not considered um, as significant as the larger audit adjustments above. Um, so we had some changes to the capital commitments note um, following the receipt of grant notifications, some minor changes to the IFRS 16 disclosure, uh, and a few amendments to notes 3, 27 and 22, just minor clarifications there. Um, and then, as Barry mentioned, on page 57, we have added some additional narrative around our final fees as well. So those are the changes uh, that have taken place between 16th of October and the date of sign off on the 18th of November. And I'd be happy to take any questions on those. OK, thank you, Sophie. Uh, if you've got questions, either raise your virtual hand or try waving at me and uh, see if I see you. At the moment, I have no one. Okay, are you happy I move on to next business then? And uh, thank Grant Thornton for the contribution. Yeah, Barry. Yeah, sorry, if I may just make um, one further comment. So yep. um, a couple of pieces of news in respect of the in respect to the audit team. So I'm pleased to say that um, Sophie um, is increasing the audit population uh, next year, um, so she won't be available because she is uh, will be on maternity leave. Um, so we're trying to recruit them young and uh, get them in-house. Um, so Sophie won't be around as the audit manager. 
Um, and I'm afraid that I'm also going to be leaving uh, the audit um, as the engagement lead. Um, I've got a new role um, within the team um, and therefore um, I need to give up uh, uh, the, the audit of uh, the West of England Combined Authority. I'm pleased to confirm that you will be familiar and many of you may be familiar with the, the person that's taking over from me. So John Roberts, who's currently the engagement lead and partner for the South West, who at the moment looks after Bristol City Council and will continue to look after Bristol City Council, will also be taking over as the engagement lead um, for Weka. So I would just like to put on record, um, I've signed off four sets of accounts uh, for the authority. Um, thank you very much for all your support over the years. Um, and I wish you every success for the future. Thank you, Barry. And, and I'm sure we all wish you every success for the future as well. So thank you. Right, so we move on to item eight on the report, the Treasury Management Strategy 21-22 and the monitoring update. Who's going so, Jay, I'm looking for Solange or Steve are going to introduce this one? It's going to be myself, Malcolm. Okay, Steve. Over to okay. you. Thank you, Chair. So this is um, the draft Treasury Management Statement for the next financial year 21-22. Uh, the, the strategy itself builds on the foundations of the previous year's strategy um, and has been updated to reflect uh, COVID and economic factors, credit risks and cash flow um, from the current financial year. Uh, <clears throat> as, as we heard previously in, in, in training, the uh, primary objective of the strategy is to safeguard public funding whilst generating uh, financial returns on cash held within the strategy. There is a, a list of approved investment options. Um, and of course, we operate the strategy within the framework of the set for code of practice and the Prudential Code um, itself. Um, so going into uh, the, the body of the strategy document, um, section two outlines the external context so what's happened um, economically during this financial year? Um, so it, we mentioned interest rates and the consumer price index, the credit outlook um, and interest rate forecasts. Uh, section three is closer to home. It's the local context. Um, so it, it's a, a very brief local context. Um, and as at the 31st of October, Worker held 250 million pounds worth of investments and currently has no borrowing. Uh, the, the current capital expenditure plans currently imply that there's no um, need to borrow in the short term or during the next financial year for capital expenditure. Uh, section four is the investment strategy. Um, so the the balance is held by the authority um, since the 1st of April 2020 is ranged between 178 million and 285 million. Um, but the, the, the larger amounts tend to, uh, to come in at the start of the financial year, so April, May, June, that's when the balances are at their highest. Um, and for the next financial year, we're expected, uh, obviously, as we, we have some expenditure spend, grant payments, and capital spend. We're anticipating the balances drop um, to a maximum level of 210 million and a lower level of closer to 125 million pounds. Um, within uh, section four again, paragraph 4.6 uh, mentions the potential impact of negative interest rates during the next financial year. Um, Arlen Close, our treasury advisors, um, they are predicting uh, the base rate remains the same, but it, it, it's anyone's guess really what, what will happen there. Um, so we've mentioned that in the strategy as well and the possible impact on our investments for that. Uh, section 4.9 is a list and a table of the approved counterparties um, where the authority can invest at any one time and for the duration. The actual table itself in figure one should be read in conjunction with 
the notes underneath, which talks about the credit rating. Um, we, we invest with uh, no entity that has a credit rating below A minus. We're regularly updated with these credit ratings from our treasury advisors on in close. Um, we touch on uh, lending with banks and building societies and secured investments down through government and other corporate entities. Uh, money market funds, which hold our liquidity. We do have some strategic pooled funds, about 23 million pounds worth, uh, shown on our financial statements at the end of the year. Um, with the potential uh, fall in interest rates and the, the, currently the base rate is 0 0.1, we're not getting much of a return um, on our investments with other local authorities, uh, which we have many, and I'll, I'll touch on later when we go through the monitoring. Uh, so we, we may, in, in the next financial year, um, investigate and move towards more strategic pool funds where we will get a better return. Of course, that will be alongside advice from our treasury advisors. Um, the, we have also touched on further down on page 73, um, we, we, we will bear in mind um, our responsibilities for environmental, social and governance with our investments, um, as that will also have an impact on our decision making in the future. Um, and we, we, we are working closely with Arlen Close um, and have signed up for their ESG service. New this year, we all have also implemented a short term loan facility with our unitary authorities um, to help them out uh, with any short term loans that they may well need as a result of COVID. Um, also within the same section, we talk about investment limits, which is any amount we can uh, lend to a single organization except local government. Section five, we then move on to a borrowing strategy. We have, of course, outlined the borrowing strategy, although um, we have no short-term capital needs to borrow. Um, that, that is not necessarily to say we will not borrow in the short term. Um, as our cash flow dictates, we may, may well need to dip into short-term borrowing. Uh, we list out the sources of borrowing from the Public Works Loan Board through to local authorities, etc. And section six on page 76 is our treasury management indicators. This is where we manage our exposure uh, across uh, our investments. Um, we monitor these monthly, and of course these are raised in our monthly treasury management meetings. Section seven are, are related matters. Um, this mainly touches on the SIPFA code itself, um, our responsibilities for our financial derivatives, um, and talks about MIFID. Section eight are the financial implications. Um, so our budget for, for, for next year in terms of our investment income, so this is what we earn on interest on our investments, um, we're predicting to come in at just over one million pounds based on an average investment portfolio of 129 million. So we are expecting our interest rates to come down at an average rate of 0 0.8. Um, that obviously takes into account the higher interest rates we receive from our pooled funds offset with the lower interest rates we are currently receiving from any money lent to local authorities. And Appendix A on page 79 shows our current investment and debt portfolio position. So you can see from here that balance of 250 million pounds, most of it is invested with government bodies, mainly local authorities at 208 million. Appendix B, which is the next page on, is uh, the start of our Treasury Management Monitoring Report. 
Um, again, it details 31st of October, we have 250 million pounds, which is an increase on 170 million pounds from uh, the financial year end from the year before. Uh, the, the, the actual table uh, gives a breakdown of, of um, the dates of, of when these funds mature. So as at the end of October, we had access to 18 million pounds in terms of liquidity. We had 23, almost 24 million pounds invested with multi-pooled assets. And the, the rest of the balances there are spread across local authorities maturing on a range from one month to more than 12 months. The next page on page 81 is a summary of the investments again. So we can see exactly where we've invested our cash across the money market funds, the pooled funds and local authorities. On page 82, it, it, these are just a, a more colorful um, version of the tables above um, in the version of pie chart, so you can see exactly uh, how our money is invested. And again, most of them, most of those three charts shows you over three quarters of our, our, our cash is invested with local authorities, which is, is the safest place for it to be other than central government. And that is the end of the strategy document. So I'm happy to take any, any questions, if anybody has any. That is a... Yep. Um, right, so Andy Wake first and then Gary. Hello, thank you, Steve. Um, my question is about the bizarre concept, in my mind, anyway, of investing in local authorities, because speaking as a councillor of a local authority, we haven't got any money, but that's a, that's a slight problem. But um, looking down the list, given what Tom said earlier on about Croydon, how do you go about selecting which local authority to choose? And I noticed that you haven't chosen any of the authorities that make up Wecker, or indeed any of the authorities uh, around Wecker, like Somerset, Wiltshire, or, or, or Gloucestershire. Is, is that a policy or is that just coincidental? So, uh, and also, why are some five and some 10? I'm just, I'd just like to know a little bit more about the process you go through to decide which local authorities are lucky enough to have our money. Thank you. Steve, if, if I have a first go and you come in on the second in terms of which yeah, sure. one you choose. Um, Council, we, we don't actually invest in our local authorities. and it, it, It's our investments. In effect, where um, those are local authorities got the need to borrow on the short term. So, so rather than go to PWLB, they're, they're coming to us uh, and we're actually providing them with a, a, a short term loan. Now, as Steve said in his, his presentation and in the documents, you know, it has been a good source of, of, of good churn for us. So primarily, most of our investments with local authorities have been for 12 months and we've been able to get 0.91% on some of those deals. But in the current climate, it's gone right down to 0.1, 0.2 at best. So it, it's something we need to change going forward. But um, uh, it, it's not... We're not actually, uh, in terms of the regional local authorities, we're very mindful that, particularly with COVID, that, that the West of England local authorities might have problems in accessing cash. So as part of our um, last committee report, we did actually open up this, this uh, uh, West of England Unitary Authority loan scheme. So we, we make our money available first to Baines, South Gloss, North Somerset and, and Bristol City Council. So if there's a need for cash flow in any of those authorities, we have been uh, uh, keeping liquidity in our back pockets ready to, to furnish out if needed. Now, at the moment, although we set that scheme up, it hasn't been called upon of day, uh, of yet. Um, but but just to reassure people, yeah, we, we are uh, in effect, what, what, what we're doing is using our cash balances to provide short term, you know, 12 months primarily loans to other local authorities who've got the need to borrow money. Steve, do you want to come into which ones we choose and why? Yeah, sure. We 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 use a series of brokers um, who actually affect these these deals for us and for the authority who's who's borrowing the money for us. And of course, Arling Close as well. Um, so so very much it's it, it it depends on the timing as well in, in order to get the better rates. And the longer you invest with them, um, the better rates you will receive. So if, if we've had some cash come in and we have 10, 15 million available uh, to, to invest, it's, 
some local authorities will need 10 million pounds and are happy to give um, an extremely good rate in order to borrow that from us. Um, and others don't need it a, a, as much. Um, so th there's always local authorities who need to borrow money. So we, we just try to get the best rate available. And if a local authority will, will take the full 10 million pounds, um, usually the, the higher you lend to them, the better the rate will be. And, and in a nutshell, what, what, what we can provide is, is a, a loan to local authorities, which is cheaper than they can access the money through a Public Works Loan Board. And for us, we get a better return than we would if we put it into the bank or building society. So it's a win-win if we can work, broker the right deal. Yeah, yeah that's, thank you. That's, that's much clearer. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Gary. Yeah, um, the risk reward um, uh, calculations have changed quite a lot and quite dramatically recently. Now, the primary uh, objective, surely, of Treasury management is to protect future purchasing power, and we are cash rich. Should we not, therefore, be looking at some more active use of that money rather than getting you know, a, a very tiny rate from uh, other local authorities? So, so again, shall I take it first, uh, Steve? Um, totally agree. I mean, but uh, we've got to be careful in terms of the amount of money we put away longer term, um, uh, because obviously, although we're cash rich at the moment, we we have got plans to spend the entire 350 million Weka investment program by March 23. Um, now, the timing of grants coming in and the timing of us spending the money, it, there's always going to be a lag between the two. Um, at the moment, as Steve outlined in the strategy, we have got some longer term investments earning a good return. So we've got the um, best part of £10 million in a property fund uh, and we've got two investments in, in multi-asset funds, which are both earning um, you know, 39 to 4.5% returns. Now, I think going forward, uh, putting money into other local authorities, as I say at the moment, uh, the returns are... Um, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 at best. So I think we need to challenge, and we are challenging our advisors, Ali and Close, about should we be diversifying our investments even further? Should we be putting more money away in, into uh, the equivalent of, of maybe some sort of uh, risk-based bonds? Uh, should we be considering more equities? Should we be considering more, more asset funds? Um, now, the, the problem is, is getting the right balance. We need to put money away longer to be able to get the right returns. Um, we need to push those boundaries. But then the capital value, uh, if we do look towards spending more money in equities, et cetera, the value of those could go down short term. So we need to be clear about what element of our portfolio we could put away for a longer duration. Um, but I, I totally agree that at the moment, we, we rely very heavily on, on a, big, a big chunk of our portfolio being with other local authorities. We're very mindful that the mix of that going forward has to look quite different. But it's incredibly challenging time to get any sort of return without taking any risk on Treasury activities in the current environment. Well, surely uh, at the moment, uh, we're not actually taking a risk, we're actually guaranteeing that we're going to lose purchasing power. Uh, so that's, that's the worst kind of risk analysis. The worst kind of risk analysis for me is putting money away with government at a, a negative interest rate, because I just can't get my head yeah. around that one. But I do understand the point. So I, I was looking in a similar vein. Um, if I look at the table that shows the yields on the investments, my calculation suggests that we receive about a million pound of income from the pool funds, which are 25 million pounds. And we receive about 2 million pounds of investments from the loans, which are 200 and whatever million pounds. Um, it did strike me that if chart two on page 82, which shows the investments allocated by the different categories, were actually presented to show the income from the different categories, it would highlight the point that Gary's making even more, because it would show that we are getting a third of our income from whatever it is about less than 10% of our investment. So th the question then was, uh, you mentioned, Malcolm, about the possibility of, of more pooled investments next, in the next financial year. 
Is there any mention of how that takes place? And otherwise, would it be one lump sum invested or would it be a drip drip approach over the course of the financial year? Because th the fact is that we'd all recognize that a market adjustment is perfectly possible. And so we, we've got all the constraints about the limits to what we invest, but not necessarily a restriction on spreading the investment over a period of time, make, rather than making it is one lump sum when the decision is taken. We, we have, um, Chair, we have, we have got in our um, indicators, as Steve outlined in the strategy, we, we do have timing indicators as well to make sure that we do have a spread of, of the investments that we, we make. And we're not waiting wait until next financial year to, to look at these new pool investments. We're looking now. So, so uh, even this week, we've had a couple of presentations with, with possible other pool funds that we could invest in. Uh, we've got another one tomorrow and one on Monday. So we are looking to make um, other longer term investments um, in the next um, couple of weeks, if not, if not uh, certainly before the end of March. We've got to be mindful, though, that, that um, these are long term investments. Yeah. And, and, and um, yeah, we've got to be careful that we don't leave ourselves in a situation that in two years' time we end up with not enough cash flow to, to fund the, the investment programs we've got planned because then we'd have to go into the, the realms of borrowing. And the cost of borrowing is always more than you're going to get a return on investment. So um, if we don't get our cash flow forecasting right, we just got to balance that conundrum. But I totally understand the point. Yeah, we are trying to push the boundaries. But I will also be very transparent with members that actually the investments we made for the pool funds, um, although they're providing us with a very healthy revenue return, if we were to sell those funds as of today, we'd make a loss because actually the capital value of those funds have gone down. And that's the nature of the beast. So we've got to be careful we don't speculate too much with a public sector purse. So, um, so we need to make sure we've got enough cash flow for the longer term to put these investments away longer to generate uh, a, a revenue annual revenue return, but also ride out the storm to make sure when we do need to sell the funds in four or five years time, uh, we can keep hold of it for that length of time rather than take the, the troughs. Thank you, Malcolm. Don. Thanks, Chair. How much is um, what you, the interest that you can manage to get dependent on the um, clarity of the timeline on the capital program? Well, all of our investments are based on our, our, our cash flow forecasting. So, so, so um, in theory, uh, if, you, if it come the end of March 2023, all of the investment fund that we have, all the Transforming Cities fund we have, the vast majority of it will be spent. But we're very mindful. Part of it's a, 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 it is very structured in terms of how we forecast when the spend's coming out and when the grants are coming in. We also need to have a little bit of crystal ball gazing in terms of what other funding is going to come into the region over the next sort of six months, year, two years, etc. So, so the whole art behind the strategy is, is understanding the cash flow in terms of you know what what is going to be our um, always consistent lowest level balance versus what are going to be our peaks. So we've always got to balance that sort of conundrum up. So we've got very detailed cash flow forecasting in the background, but some of it we have to overlay with what we think is going to happen in the coming years. Okay, and the combined authority can't borrow, can it? It without, can borrow. Um, without, and, without and in the strategy, sorry. Does it need specific permission to borrow? So we can borrow to cover cash flow. So it's in a strategy and we have borrowed once at the end of last financial year just to cover a shortage in, in cash flow. Um, so we, we, can, we can borrow on a very operational basis. We haven't pushed the boundaries and actually requested to borrow long term. We haven't had to because we've got the cash balances that we have. Um, in theory, should we ever be in a position where we totally utilize our, our Transforming Cities Fund and, and gain share investment funding? Could we borrow uh, in the future as a combined authority? Um, quite possibly we could, but we haven't had the need to sort of address that one at, at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? In which case, can I just ask for a show of hands of those approving the report? Yeah, okay, anybody against? No. Okay, right. Well, thank you. And uh, Malcolm, Steve, Solange, thank you for that report as well. Very comprehensive, very detailed, and 
and very helpful. And I, I, I suspect other members feel like me that momentarily we understand it, but make no promises that that will be the case in, in a few hours or a few weeks time. But thank you for, for presenting it in such a, a comprehensive way. Uh, the next item on the agenda, item eight is the, uh, sorry, item nine is the internal audit update. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, and good afternoon to everyone. So this report starts at page 85 of your pack, uh, item nine, and is an update on our work so far this year and our plans for the rest of this particular financial year. So I'm just going to hand over now to um, and introduce uh, one of my audit managers, Pete Charles. Uh, at the last audit committee, Pete presented the item around the whistleblowing review for WECA. Um, and Pete is overseeing um, our internal audit work on the ground. So I'm going to hand over to Pete um, and he'll talk you through the report. Pete. OK, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yes, as Jeff said, I'm pleased to provide you with an update of the uh, delivery of this year's internal audit plan. Um, I think it's best to kick off by um, acknowledging the impact of COVID on the plan. So um, a lot of local authorities have been quite heavily impacted by COVID. So, um, for example, administering a range of new grant schemes um, and obviously providing a, a number of frontline services. Um, the impact, while still significant um, on WECA, is not quite so widespread. Um, so as a result, um, that we haven't introduced any specific reviews um, within the COVID area. Um, but there's two things which we've continued to do throughout. Um, the first is to consider the impact within individual reviews. So, um, for example, at the start of the audit, is there a need to introduce something within the scope? Um, or are there in any impacts on the timelines or the availability of staff who might have been affected within, within their own work? Um, and the second thing is to continue to be flexible and work in consultation. So, of course, if and when the position changes um, and there may be targeted audits that are required, um, of course, we'll discuss this with uh, senior managers, with uh, Section 151 officer um, and, of course, audit committee chair to see if there's any targeted reviews uh, necessary at any point. Um, it's also important, I think, to consider um, the impact on our individual audit opinions um, and, of course, of the overall uh, internal control framework. Um, this is largely down to new ways of working. So, of course, um, ourselves and staff at WECA have had to um, adapt our auditing methodologies and our arrangements because of COVID. So this includes both the systems that we're using. So a lot of staff are now working from home conducting the reviews. Um, but then also the techniques. So, for example, um, where we would, would, would have been sat next to a member of staff to do a walkthrough of a process, that's now done by video um, and evidence is requested by, uh, by digital copy. Um, so uh, we just have to acknowledge that that may introduce some limitations in terms of the assurance that can be provided. Um, so, yeah, it's just worth bearing that in mind. We don't know perhaps the full impact of what that limitations mean. Um, we're confident with the, the systems that we're using and the processes that we're using and, and the IT security, um, but we just have to bear in mind kind of longer term what impact that might have on the assurance that we provide. So the main context of the um, report here. So um, in July was when we presented the uh, proposed audit plan for this year. It included both individual audit areas, but uh, uh, alongside the overall assessment of the internal control framework uh, using our reasonable assurance model. Um, the plan or the kickoff of the plan was fairly significantly impacted uh, by COVID. Um, of course, the time that planning was being conducted and the, the plan was being uh, signed off was exactly when the, the largest impact was being felt um, in, the, in the initial stages of, of COVID. Um, the result of that there was that in quarter one, it was only the, uh, the Growth Hub grant certification um, and the IT risks uh, pen testing reviews that were conducted within uh, quarter one. Uh, obviously, that has an impact and a knock on by the fact that a number of audits um, are now to be delivered in quarters three and four, but we're confident with the plan in place um, to deliver all of those. Um, and if you go to uh, the table in paragraph eight, so this provides the position as of the 1st of November. Um, and obviously being November because um, uh, the timelines that we have to provide this information for scrutiny prior to, uh, to the committee. Um, and if you, if you have a look through the table, there's no significant issues for us to raise um, on the plan itself. 
Um, other than just a note to say that we're continuing to provide assurance over the, uh, the ICT and financial systems program. Um, so you'll note that there's a number of audits which are currently in progress within that area. Um, I should note that we've continued to be as flexible as we can with delivery of the plan. Uh, I think this year more than uh, other years, um, priorities have changed at quite short notice. So we're trying to do our best to react to those uh, and to move reviews where possible. Um, so a couple of examples, we have the adult education budget review, which was initially for Q3. Um, that's been pushed back to Q4 just due to um, organizational priorities of, 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 uh, of WECA. Um, and in addition, as you'll know, the whistleblowing review. Um, so whistleblowing basically formed the focus of the counter fraud arrangement review, which was um, originally in the plan. And obviously that was as, as a response um, to a request from the, uh, from the committee. Um, but we'll continue to be as flexible as we can and provide support um, where we can and, and where it's needed across the business um, because it's going to keep changing. Um, and so we'll, we'll do our best to, uh, to uh, support where we can. And just to wrap up, um, we just recommend that you just take a look through the, uh, the, work, uh, the work plan, so the table in, in paragraph eight, just to note progress against the plan. Um, and we aim to provide the next formal update against the plan in April. So thank you. Okay, can I, uh, can I just start with, 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 with one question? Is clearly, the, the pandemic has produced all sorts of challenges and I can see that for internal audit as well. Um, but in terms of the authority, I presume that there is a lot more working from home than would have been ever anticipated. Does that produce further audit risks? And are you, do you have any work program identified to check on the implications of working from home? Uh, Jeff, are you happy if I take this initially? Yep, yep, carry on. Um, so I think it's a, a very important point to raise um, that, that it can have an impact. And, and, and as I mentioned, it can, um, it, it can cause some limitations um, because the assurance that you can provide is, is done differently. So um, that's not to say it's necessarily better or worse, but if you're sat next to someone um, and reviewing the, the, the work that's being done, you will get a different picture compared to um, obtaining information by email or, or by a video call. Um, so we do have to continue to bear that in mind and to uh, look at our systems and processes to make sure that we are able to provide um, good assurance across the, uh, the audits that we, um, we provide. Um, and in terms of um, any planned audit work, so at the moment we don't have uh, anything in the plan specifically to be looking at these kind of arrangements, but it is a, a kind of a moving feast, let's say, where we are continuing to, to review the risks uh, in that area. Um, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're open to provide support or to review anything in that area if, uh, if, if you feel there's a need. But certainly from, from my point of view, I'm, I'm trying to think through what the risks are. And I can see from an audit point of view, not being able to look someone in the eye when you're asking them a question is, is, is a problem. But, but equally, that person is not necessarily looking their assistant in the eye when they're approving an invoice and and so it was really only a question that at this stage probably all I, all I'm thinking is perhaps for our next meeting just some thoughts from internal audit on how that might alter your work program ongoing um, so, I just think we ought to be considering it and have it on record so uh, I, I, so, uh, if, if I could just sort of help there Joe I think that's a really excellent point um, it's something that we've been considering throughout all our audits. So if you take um, a couple of good examples, if we were auditing, um, I don't know, a stock control system, we would obviously go into a, an area where your stores were and we'd be able to observe the way in which people had approached storage as much as look at a particular IT system. Um, when you're doing it in, in, in a auditing in a remote way, obviously you can observe those things in the same way and you're reliant on IT systems in the main, um, and you're reliant on the views and opinions given to you face to face from people that you are auditing. So you're absolutely right that some of the key risks are around some of our controls around access to IT systems and the effectiveness of the controls around those around our key financial and, and core systems. Um, so something that we've been thinking about throughout all our audits to ensure that 
we look at the sample sizes as well. Um, so we can adjust those uh, dependent on the scope of activity that we're actually looking at. Um, but I think, you know, the point is really well made and we're very happy to come back and provide you with some examples um, that, 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 that we have used. Obviously, from a WECA perspective, the actual audit plan is only 100 days. So it's, it, it was pretty small in sort of volume terms. So the number of audits that we're carrying out is relatively small in comparison with a traditional local authority where you'd be experiencing um, uh, maybe many scores or even 100 or more audit exercises in one particular year. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, Don. Thanks. Um, there is an awful lot of cybercrime around at the moment. There's an awful lot of opportunists, and um, I've seen one particularly where um, an invoice that was virtually indistinguishable from a regular invoice, in fact, um, with some inside knowledge, came to an organisation, um, and uh, a lot of money was lost. So I think that's an area that really um, needs to be, we need to be absolutely sure. This is a high risk, very high risk area at the moment, maybe in terms of, I mean, I see that looks like it's been completed, but um, it may well be worth bearing in mind that that's something to keep looking at now and other things perhaps can wait. Excellent point, fully agree, thank you, Tom. And, and, and if I may, so um, I, yeah, I agree, it is an excellent point. And particularly, um, we've seen a lot of instances uh, from professional bodies who who've, um, provide updates of, um, of very specifically COVID-related um, frauds and COVID-related um, cybercrime attempts. And um, it's normally at a time when uh, systems or uh, organisations are quite vulnerable for, for a number of uh, reasons that, um, that it opens them up to these kinds of fraud. Um, so I should say we are plugged into a number of uh, anti-fraud bodies who regularly do provide updates of alerts and current frauds that are out there. So we continue to monitor those and, and provide uh, uh, information to WECA where we feel there could be a, a weakness. Yeah, and, and um, just one more comment is don't un underestimate the power of just plain training, I think, because, in, you know, it just takes a click on a, a morning when you're not you're a bit tired or something like that and then you've got an awful lot of work to unpick once that uh, money has gone out absolutely yes totally agree thank you don anybody else no in which case jeff peter thank you for your contribution um that concludes this meeting our next meeting is scheduled for thursday the 25th of February. Um, and can I just take this opportunity to all wish you a healthy and safe Christmas and New Year and look forward to seeing you on the 25th of February. I declare this meeting closed. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Rob. Merry Christmas to you too. <laughs>